Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the wonderful experience that you have been given to us, dear Lord, sharing with us all of these important truths. Lord, as we seek to finish up this small series, I pray, dear Father, that you please be with our minds. Please give us wisdom and understanding, the ability to comprehend that which we're going to learn and to understand. And I just pray that you would keep us to the Zen, be with all those who are watching online, those who will watch this in the future. And we just pray that you would keep us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. In light of that, let us open up our Bibles to the book of Genesis. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 11. Opening up our Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 11. Now we see on our screen here, this is a symbol of gay pride. We've been able to, to talk about and to delineate many of these things. Our series is entitled Pride and Glory, Pride and Glory. We went to Genesis chapter 9. Uh, we saw the history of the rainbow. We saw what it really, what it really uh, connotates. We saw that the rainbow is a symbol of God's covenant to restore fallen man back into the image of God. We saw this. It's a symbol, unfortunately, of the debauchery of homosexuality. We saw this with uh, lesbianism. These things are just so sad. Uh, we see here uh, androgynism with Prince. We see here with this uh, K-pop artist. We see Grace Jones. Uh, the popularizing of this androgenic type of dressing. Uh, we see here a woman who has uh, literally surgically sought to make herself a man. It's astonishing even just looking at these pictures. This is actually a biological woman. We saw this before. Uh, genuinely shocking. I say that just not for, for factor. This here is a biological man who has literally surgically sought to make uh, himself a woman. Shocking even to see this. Again, this is a biological man who literally looks like a woman. Again, we have here a biological man who has literally surgically done things to make himself a woman, as it were. Again, we saw here, when is Pride Month? We saw some of this history. We saw some of this history. Now, in our previous session, we were able to go through the history of the French Revolution and the legacy that the French Revolution has left not only here in America, but around the entire world. Ever since that time, around 1798, when those two witnesses were coming to the end of their testimony, the influence of the principles that were perpetuated in the French Revolution literally have a lasting legacy down to uh, this time and even in the future, all the way up until Christ's second coming. Now we come to this particular point here. Now we are opened up to Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. And what we're going to do, actually before we turn to Genesis chapter 11, let's turn to... Let's turn to, let's turn to, let's turn to Ecclesiastes. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes. We're turning in our Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. We're turning to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Now there's a principle, a biblical principle uh, that we're going to read here before we get into our text in Genesis. Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes chapter 1, starting in verse 9. Now notice what the Bible says. Notice what the Bible says. It says, The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. So the Bible brings out the principle that that which we see taking place in society today is that which has already been in the past and we're actually going to see this very definitive definitively as we seek to bring this two-part series to a close now there are some ancient aspects to this issue of homosexuality and everything associated with that is in, very important for us to intelligently understand if we're going to be really uh, able as god-fearing christians to combat the influence of these things now notice this notice this now, this here is a symbol of something called the Tower of Babel. Now, let's turn in our Bibles back to the book of Genesis chapter 11. Let's turn in our Bibles back to the book of Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 1. 
Now it's amazing, the history of the world as we know it, the vast majority of it gets its roots from what happened at the Tower of Babel on the plains of Shinar. In verse 1, the Bible says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, they have all one language, and this they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. And verse 7, it says, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from the uh, thence from upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Verse 9, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now, we don't have time to get into the details, into the lasting legacy in its totality of this Babelesque experience, but we're going to focus in on a few things. Now, here we have a picture up of, of a particular individual. Now, I wonder if any of us know who this individual is. This is an artist's rendition of a particular individual by the name of Nimrod ben Kush. Nimrod ben Kush. Now, the Bible talks about this individual... Nimrod, and it's amazing because some people think that the Bible has no historical significance. Now, that's a gross misunderstanding of not only Bible prophecy, but of just general human history itself. Now, again, we referenced this in a previous study, but according to such men as even George Rawlinson, that professor of ancient history at Oxford University during the 19th century, in his book called The Origin of Nations, declare that the Toldoth ben I Noah, or the book of the sons of the generations of Noah, or simply Genesis, is the oldest ethnographic essay that we have of the society and dispersion of nations as we know it today. Now, we're, see, we're seeing here in our Bibles, we're seeing here in our Bibles, Genesis chapter 10, starting in verse 6. Now, notice the Bible, it says, And the sons of Ham, Cush, as, and Mizram, Miriz, uh, Raim, and Phut, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba, Havila, Sabta, and Rama, and, Sab, and uh, Sabteka, and the sons of Rama, and Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. In verse 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, or, where, or when you read in the margin, that means against the Lord. So Nimrod was a hunter who was against God. It says, a, a mighty hunter before the Lord or against the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even Nimrod was the mighty hunter before the Lord or against the Lord. So the Bible declares twice within the same verse that Nimrod was a man who was against the Lord. Now let's notice the historical, historical significance of this individual. And it says, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So the person who helped to greatly influence that construction on the, on the plains of Shinar, the Tower of Babel, was a gentleman by the name of Nimrod. A gentleman by the name of Nimrod. So the question is, I wonder, if the lasting legacy of this homosexuality and everything associated with it, I wonder if it traces its origin back to the plains of Shinar at the Tower of Babel that started with Nimrod. I wonder. Now notice what Sir Isaac Newton has to say about Nimrod. Now many of us don't even know that Isaac Newton studied heavily the books of Daniel and the Revelation. Isaac Newton was a very brilliant man that not only studied mathematics and physics and all those other things and science, 
but he also studied history and Bible prophecy. Notice what Isaac Newton says in regards to Nimrod. Nimrod founded a kingdom at Babylon. We just read that in Genesis. And perhaps extended it into Assyria. But this kingdom was but of small extent if compared with the empires which rose up afterwards. So this is an amazing historical context. That was written in the book that he wrote called The Chronology of Ancient Kingdoms. Again, the aforementioned George Rawlinson. Notice what George Rawlinson has to say as it pertains to Nimrod. Nimrod, the son or descendant of Cush, set up a kingdom in lower Mesopotamia, which attracted the attention of the surrounding nations. A primitive Babylon, Babylonian kingdom is assigned to a people distinctly said to have been Cushite by blood. The people whom he led pro came probably by sea. At any rate, the earliest settlements were on the coast and Ur or her on the right bank of the Euphrates. Now, this is the same Ur of the Chaldees that Abraham came out of when God told him that he was going to make him a great nation. It says, at a very short distance from it, uh, Abakuchur was the primitive capital. I might have pronounced that incorrectly. There is little doubt, but that it is in honor of his apotheosis. Notice, notice this. I'm going to read this again. There is little doubt, but that it is in honor of his apotheosis or his legend that the constellation Orion bears in Arabian astrology the title of El Jabbar or the giant. You see, because in uh, the book of the Bible, in Nimrod, when it describes him in Genesis chapter 10, when it's talking about uh, Nimrod, it actually comes from that word, that word Jabbar, which means giant, which means giant. And this is an amazing point that it emphasizes here. It says that as a result of his apotheosis, the constellation Orion. You see, the reality is Orion is just a, a personage for Nimrod. Orion is just a personage for Nimrod. Nimrod and Orion are the same individual. Notice this. And that was from the book that he wrote called The Seven Great Monarchies of the Ancient Eastern World. Now, this is a symbol of an individual by the name of Hercules. Now, I wonder, or Orion, I wonder if these individuals are the same person. This says Orion, a major constellation, a mighty hunter of great beauty and gigantic strength. Now, that's the same type of description that we read of Nimrod in the book of Genesis. It says in the lower world, his shade is, see his shade is seen by Odysseus, driving the wild beast before him as he had done on earth. After his death, he was changed into the constellation called by his name. It took the form of a warrior wearing a girdle of three stars and a lion skin carrying a club and a sword. It's now, And that was taken from the Encyclopedia Britannica. So we see here very clearly that Orion and Nimrod are the same individual. The same individual. Now, no, now remember, we're coming to a point. We're coming to a point. All right, now here we bring forth Hercules. We've all heard of Hercules before. Now again, I wonder if Hercules is the same person of Nimrod. I wonder if Hercules is just a different personage for Nimrod. We're coming to a point. Notice Hercules and the lion skin. Greeks and Romans rarely wore fur. However, mythological figures are often depicted dressed in exotic furs and skins. This says one example is the legendary hero and demigod Heracles, who was the son of the god Zeus and his human mistress Alcmene. This says as a punishment for murdering his wife, Heracles was or, or Hercules was ordered to undertake 12, sta 12 tasks or the 12 labors of Hercules. Jumping down, it says with his Herculean supernatural power, Heracles strangled the lion with his bare hands. Thereafter, he dressed in it skin 
with such a way that his head peeked out of its gaping jaws. So you see here, this same description that is given of Orion is the same description that is given of Hercules. So in actuality, Hercules is actually Orion and Orion is actually Nimrod. Does that make sense? All right, that makes sense. All right, let's continue. Now, this is a symbol of the ancient worship of the sun, the ancient worship of the sun. Now, I wonder what all of this has to do with sun worship. Notice this. In the history of mankind, no form of idolatry has been more widely practiced than that of the worship of the sun. Now, this is taken from a book called The Two Republics. We'll eventually get to it. Notice. It may be well described as universal, for there is scarcely a nation in which the worship of the sun in some form has not found a place. In Egypt, the oldest nation of historic times, under the names of Ra and Osiris, with a half dozen other forms. In Phoenicia and the land of Canaan, under the names of Baal, uh, Melkarth, Shamas, uh, Adonai, Moloch, and many other forms. Not to be confused with the Adonai. In Syria, Tammuz and El Gabalus, among the Moabites, under the names of Belpeor, Belpeor and Shamash, among the Babylonians and Assyrians, under the names of Bel and Shamas, under the Medes and Persians and other kindred nations, under the name of Ormuz and Mitra, among the ancient Indians, under the name of Mitra, Mitra, and Mitras. So before we go on and continue, we see here very clearly that sun worship was worshipped under many different names of different gods. So whether the sun god was called, as we see here, whether it was called Mitra in India, whether it was called Tammuz in Syria, whether it was called Baal in Canaan and Phoenicia, it is all depicting the worship of the same deity, which was a representation of the sun. Now let's see what the original name of this sun deity was. Going on, it says, in Greece, under the name of Adonis, notice Apollo, Bacchus, and Hercules. Now remember, Hercules is just Orion, and Orion is just the personage for Nimrod. We saw this already. So in actuality, the same sun god that has been worshipped in all of these different civilizations over the course of human history is just a different reiteration of the god or worship of Nimrod, which was a representation of the sun. So all of this literally is merely sun worship, worshiping the god Nimrod, who is a representation of the sun. This says under the term uh, Attis and in Rome under Bacchus, Apollo and Hercules, in all these places and under all forms, the sun was worshipped by all these people. So when people talk about worshipping Hercules or Baal or all of these different things, they were actually just worshipping Nimrod. Now let's get an example of this. Let's get an example of this. Let's turn to 1 Kings. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. Unfortunately, we're about to read the experience, some of the experience of the King Solomon. And Solomon fell into some of the grossest forms of idolatry. Notice this. The Bible says, starting in verse, uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, starting in verse 4, the Bible says, For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. Now, we're, now we know that Solomon is famous for having 300 wives and 700 concubines. Insane levels of licentiousness. It says, And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Astoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord as David his father, 
Then did Solomon build a high place for Shamash. Now remember, we just saw here in our quotation that Shamash was the same God that was worshipped by the Moabites, again, who in actuality was just a personage for Nimrod. Just a personage for Nimrod. So when uh, Solomon was falling into apostasy, worshipping all of these pagan gods, he was really worshipping Nimrod, which was a representation of of the sun. Now we're going to get back to Solomon before we close out this study. It says the myth of Hercules alone will illustrate the widespread practice of this worship. The mythology of Hercules is of a very mixed character in the form in which it has come down to us. There is in the identification of one or more Grecian heroes with Melkarth, the sun god of the Phoenicians, Hence, we find Hercules so frequently represented as the sun god. So we just made that very clear. And his 12 labors regarded as the passage of the sun through the 12 signs of the zodiac. He is the powerful planet which animates and imparts uh, fesundity to the universe, whose divinity has been honored in every quarter by temples and altars and consecrated in the religious strains of all nations. From Mero in Ethiopia and Thebes in Upper Egypt, even to Britain and the icy regions of Scythia, from the ancient Taprobana to Pabalothra in India to Cadiz and to the shores of the Atlantic, from the forests of Germany and the burning sands of Africa, notice, everywhere in short, where the benefits of the luminary of the day or the sun are experienced, there we find established the name and worship of a Hercules. So Hercules was just a representation for the sun being worshiped as the sun God. And we saw clearly that Hercules is just, <coughs> pardon, the personification of Orion. And Orion is just the personification, another personification for Nimrod, for Nimrod. <clears throat> All right, so we saw this very clearly. Now, let's turn back in our Bible to the book of 1 Kings before we continue on in this. Let's turn to 1 Kings. We're going to start in verse 4 again. The Bible says, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 4. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians. Now, most people don't even understand nor know that, that, that Solomon went so far away from God that Solomon himself even became himself a homosexual. Now, some people even hearing this may think that this is insane blasphemy to even say that Solomon became a homosexual, but this is the sad reality. Notice. Now, the reason why we say this is because in verse 5, the Bible says, that Solomon went after Ashtoreth. Now, if anyone knows anything about the goddess Ashtoreth, Ashtoreth was the fertility goddess. And just like Nimrod was worshipped under the name of Hercules in later ages, or Orion, or Shemash, or Baal, or any of these personages, the female goddess was worshipped under the names of Ashtoreth, Isis in Egypt, whether it was Diana in Rome or Greece or any of these different places. So yes, we mentioned Diana. So when we go to the movie theater and we watch such things as Wonder Woman, which is the goddess Diana, we're actually worshiping and giving homage to the fertility goddess. Now, in the worship of the fertility goddess was included homosexuality, lesbianism, pedophilia, and bestiality. And unfortunately, Solomon fully went after these gods and Solomon himself was practicing that homosexuality. Even to the point, let's continue to read. It says, Then Solomon uh, built a high place for Shamash and the abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Now, when you really understand what happened with these gods, what would happen as a result of all of this licentiousness taking place and obviously back then there wasn't such things that we have today as far as you know the contraception 
though they had some things and herbs and different things that you can think of, they didn't have what we have today. At least we don't have the record of that as yet. So as a result of all this licentiousness, unwanted children were born to these women who were practicing these degrading rites. So as a result of that, these children, and not just those children, but these children were sacrificed to these gods, such as Shamash and, and uh, Molech that we see here in verse 7. And if you see any type of picture of the god Molech, Molech would literally, it would be like an iron uh, statue that would have its hands out, and they would literally uh, light up this statue until the hands got burning hot red. And they would literally place that child on the hands of Molech and that child would literally be burnt to death as a sacrifice to the God Molech. This is what Solomon was doing. And this is literally where sin will take us because in reality, the only thing modern day abortion is, is modern day Molech worship. That's the only thing it is. So we see this very clearly. Notice this, the Egyptians, according to Plutarch, thought that Hercules had his seat in the sun and that he traveled with it around the moon. The author of the hymns ascribed to Orpheus fixes still more strongly the identity of Hercules with the sun. He calls Hercules the God who produced time, whose forms vary, the father of all things and destroyer of all. He is the God who brings back by turns Aurora and the night, and who moving onward from east to west, runs through the career of his twelve labors, the valiant titan, who chases away maladies, and delivers man from the evils which afflict him. So this was what was associated with the worship of Hercules or Nimrod. All right, now what is this? Now this is a symbol of the female goddess that has been worshipped in many civilizations. Notice what uh, this goes on to say, the two republics again, by what, by whatever name or under whatever form the sun was worshiped, there was always a female divinity associated with it. Sometimes this female was the moon, sometimes the earth, sometimes the atmosphere, and at other times simply the female principle in nature. Notice. All paganism is at bottom a worship of nature in some form or other. And in all pagan religions, the deepest notice, the deepest and most awe-inspiring attribute of nature was its power of reproduction. This is why sexual immorality is always associated with pagan religions. The mystery of birth and becoming was the deepest mystery of nature. Now, it is very true that there is a lot of mystery behind procreation. How a husband and wife can literally come together and by the grace of God create another human being. It is a mystery. But unfortunately, just as the Bible says that as a result of the paganistic mind shutting out God, that their foolish heart became darkened. This goes on to say, it lay at the root of all thoughtful paganism and appeared in various forms, some of a more innocent, others of a most debasing type. The ancient pagan thinkers, as well as to modern men of science, the key to the hidden secret of the origin and preservation of the universe lay in the mystery of sex. You see, this is the reason why sexual immorality is associated with secret societies. This is why sexual immorality is associated with every form of pagan religion. And we're actually going to find out that this is the reason why it's associated with one of the most uh, popular religions in the world today. Notice this says two energies or agents, one active and generative, the other feminine, passive or susceptible one, were everywhere thought to combine for creative purposes. And heaven and earth, sun and moon, day and night, were believed to cooperate to the production of being. S upon some such basis as this resist almost the poly polytheistic worship of the old civilization. And it may be traced backstage by sage, 
the separation of divinity into male and female gods, the deification of distinct powers of nature, and the idealization of man's own faculties, desires, and lusts, where every, where every uh, power of his understanding was embodied as some object of adoration, and every impulse of his will became an incarnation of deity. So this is the reason why in all of these civilizations, you had a god of drunken debauchery, such as one of the gods that we mentioned before. In other civilizations, you had a god of war. You had a god of fertility. You had a god of this, of that, of that, and the other. And this is the reason, because of this principle of depraved understanding of sex that ran through all of paganism. All right, now what is this right here? Now, it's amazing you know, because especially as it pertains to this idea of, you know, what is a man? What is a woman? You know, what is, uh, some, you know, what is appropriate uh, for a man to wear or what is appropriate for a woman to wear? You know, what does male sexuality look like? What does female sexuality look like? The reality is, is that God has given distinct markers as to how a man should act and how a woman should act. And when they act properly, they are attracted properly to each other, eventually ending in a marriage. Now, this is a symbol of dress. I wonder if dress has anything to do with this, sexu with this sexuality issue. I wonder. I wonder. Now, this is a, another quotation from the Two Republics. Now, notice this. Before we turn to that, let's turn in our Bibles to Deuteronomy. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22, and you can keep your finger there. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. This says, as the son was the great God and su the supreme Lord, and, ha and as he exerted his most glorious powers in reproduction, it was held to be the most acceptable worship for his devotees, so to employ themselves and their powers. Consequently, prostitution was one of the chief characteristics of sun worship wherever found. I wonder if the prostitution that is rife in society today, not only in America, but around the world, I wonder if this prostitution is a direct dedication to the sun god. It says, as the association of a female without reference to relationship, was the only requirement necessary to worship, the result was the perfect confusion of all relationships. So in every pagan civilization that has ever existed, the confusion of all relationships was always a hallmark of the pagan civilization. Among its, the worshipers, even to the mutual interchange of garments between the sexes, now, I hope that you got that. What this quotation is saying is that one of the hallmarks of this paganism was that in these civilizations, the men would wear that which the women wear and the women would, that, would wear that which the man wears. In the 18th chapter of Leviticus, there is a faithful record of such a result among the sun worshipers of the land of Canaan, whom the Lord caused to be blotted from the earth. Notice the prohibition in Deuteronomy 22, 5. Now let's read that. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5. Notice what the Bible says. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man wear that which, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So the Bible is making it very clear that when a woman wears that which pertains to a man, or, where, or when a man wears that which pertains to a woman, it is an abomination before him. Because it goes on to say the prohibition in Deuteronomy 22.5, and we just read that, was aimed directly at this practice in sun worshiping, in sun worship. So this prohibition that we read in Deuteronomy 22.5, God put that in there to especially attack the cross-dressing practice in sun worship so the reality is is that today if we are wearing that if we are a man and we wear that which pertains to a woman 
or if we are a woman and wears and we wear that which pertains to a man, we are literally practicing sun worship. Notice this. Now, this is a picture of a woman wearing pants. I wonder if women wearing pants comes directly from sun worship, you know, because um, it's amazing because I know that there are some people who are watching this who will say that the idea that a woman wearing pants is sun worship is insane, that that is a fanatical ideology, that that is literally a uh, crazy beyond belief to even assert such foolishness as that. But let's notice the history. Again, we have here, dear women wearing pants. Now, again, some people may say that there are a style of pants that a woman can wear that is feminine, that there is a style of pants that a man can wear that is intrinsically masculine. But let's see. We see we have this here. We have a woman wearing a man's clothing. Notice this. Now, this is amazing because this is from the Huffington Post. This is not from a religious outlet. Notice the history of women wearing pants as a power symbol. The Huffington Post is literally going to explain to us where women where women wearing pants, where that has come from in our society. This says off the runway retailer Ann Taylor is launching its pants are power campaign on March 1st which the company says commemorates the evolution of pants, not only in fashion, but as a symbol of equality for women and making the question who wears the pants in a relationship seem more than metaphorical. This says, of course, women wearing pants is only newly socially acceptable. And this is a point that many people don't understand when it comes to this dress question. Women wearing pants is a new phenomenon. No woman, it doesn't matter what civilization that you go to, it has always been the practice for women to wear some form of a dress or a skirt. This says, in a society controlled by the patriarchy, relatively speaking, Joanne of Arc, who herself, well, we won't get into that, Joan of Arc famously cross-dressed wearing men's armor in the 15th century as a deterrent to rape and was eventually burned at the stake in part because of this. By 1850, Amelia Bloomer, a woman's right activist, popularized the Bloomer pant. Those baggy knee or ankle length trousers Elizabeth Smith Miller created. By the 20th century, women's pants were appropriate for occasional dressing only. Now it's not just for occasional dressing, we have it even to the point now that a woman will literally go outside in her underwear and not think it a big deal. Now, again, we mentioned this in the first part of this series that a woman's body is so special and sacred that it should be, it should not be exposed like that. It's special. It says worn at design designated times as hostess pajamas or bicycling pants. Emma McLeodon, associate costume curator at the museum in New York, tells Yahoo Lifestyle by the 1920s and 30s, celebrities like Marlene Dietrich dared to wear, dared to wear full pantsuits to movie premieres. And the most daring thing about Katherine Hepburn was her pants. So the reality is, is that women wearing pants has no roots in biblical principles but it has its roots in the ideology that women should be on the same par as men. Now, from a biblical standpoint, women and men are equal. We just have different roles to play. And unfortunately, we're not going to go through all of the statistics, but as soon as this women's liberation movement has gained prominence and it's rife in society today, this, but not only this, but this is one of the main reasons that have led to the degradation of the family in society, especially in Western society. It says McLean points out that celebrities, both of those women could get away with wearing androgynous looks without persecutions, while ordinary women elsewhere would have been fine thanks to laws enacted by men. And unfortunately, it's always communicated that these ideologies come 
uh, come from nothing more than the patriarchy. And this is why there's even a push today, instead of having God the Father, we now have God the Mother. Because this idea of the oppression of the patriarchy is so great that we even want to turn God the Father into a woman. This is unfortunately where we are in society. All right. All right, going on. This says, we're going to jump down to the very bottom. It says, clothes increasingly are becoming a frontier for political activism. We're all becoming more aware of the power dynamics inherent in clothing. Now imagine this, even, pardon, even this worldly person is acknowledging that there is an inherent power that comes from clothing, that there is an inherent power that comes from clothing. So when a man wears that which pertains to a woman, there is a certain power that comes upon him. When a woman wears that which pertains to a man, there is a certain power that comes upon her. And I wonder who that power is from. I promise you it's not the Holy Spirit. Now again, we have this cross-dressing. This was a rapper. I forgot what um, his, I believe his name was Cameron. Um, back in the early 2000s, he started wearing a lot of pink clothing. And uh, because he was a so-called gangster... Uh, he made wearing pink uh, gangster eyes and he made it uh, look, look cool again, quote on quote. Now we have a gentleman by the name of Kirk Franklin. And the worst part about this is Kirk Franklin is here wearing a skirt and this man professes to be a Christian. I say this in kindness. This man must repent of his sins if he shall be uh, saved eternally. And we have here a gentleman by the name of Harry Styles wearing a dress and this is taken from prospect when harry styles met homer the surprising classical roots of gender fluid fashion notice this we're going to get down to a particular point uh yet while the majority we're going to skip this notice in greek mythology there are multiple examples of what we might today call cross-dressing in the odyssey athena frequently disguises herself as a man, while in the cult of the non-binary god uh, uh, Aphroditus, male worshippers wore women's clothing. In both ancient Greek and early Japanese kabuki theater, it was commonplace for men, partly because of women were banned from performing, to dress in women's clothing to play female roles. However, perhaps the best known example of this comes from English Renaissance theater where men played the female parts in Shakespeare plays and modern Shakespearean performance remains an arena for exploring and challenging audience perceptions of gender roles. So this worldly outlet tells us very clearly where this cross dressing came from. And as we've gone through all the history, this cross dressing dates all the way back with Nimrod to the plains of Shinar and the Tower of Babel. Now notice this. This is taken from a book that we wrote before called the, that we quoted from before called The Phallus. This says, among shamans, divinatory power is linked to bisexuality. So according to ancient uh, pagan priests, as it were, bisexuality brings you in contact with divine power. Now again, this is not the power of the Holy Spirit. In the ritual gesture of the An Anasirama, the magician dressed as a woman lifts up his robes to expose his sex, thus appearing as an androgen. The, Etru uh, a, the Etruscan thank you, prophet carried a phallus attached to her belt. Now a phallus is literally just a visible description of the male sexual organ. That's the same phallus that we call today the Washington Monument. It's the same phallus that you can find in that little area there at the Vatican at St. Peter's Basilica. In the mysteries of Hercules or Nimrod, Victor, in Italy, the God as well as the initiates were clothed as women. Notice this. Cross-dressing was supposed to promote health, youth, and vigor, and to lengthen life 
expectancy. You see, this is the poison that Satan filled the minds of men anciently, and he's still doing the same thing today. Now notice this quotation from the words of inspiration. Watchfulness and vigilance are needed now as never before in this, in the history of the race. The eye must be turned off from beholding vanity, lawlessness, the prevailing spirit of the age must be met with decided rebuke. Let none feel that they are in no danger. It says, as long as Satan lives, his efforts will be constant and untiring to make the world as wicked as before the flood and as licentious as were the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. This says those who in their self-confidence feel no need of watchfulness and unceasing prayer are near some humiliating fall. All who do not feel the importance of resolutely guarding their affections will be captivated by those who practice their arts to ensnare and lead astray the unweary. You see, the reality is because some of us may be watching this and will say, I would never engage in homosexuality. I would never engage in licentious or any of these things. I promise you, Solomon thought the very same thing. And the devil so turned out Solomon, that wise man at one time of God, Solomon turned him out so much to the point that Solomon himself was not only burning children at Molech, but he was also practicing the debauchery of homosexuality. Brothers and sisters, there is no telling what will happen to us if we take our eyes off of Jesus. This is unfortunately the reality. Now, again, I'm not trying to encourage that, that if things happen, that you need to be afraid that you're going to become a homosexual. That's not what I'm saying. But the reality is, is this. If you take your eyes off of Jesus, there is no telling where the devil will take you. All right. Now, this is a symbol of ancient sun worship. We're going to get some more historical context. Then we're going to bring this message to a close. Now, this is again J.A. Wiley. Notice what he says. It follows from the principles taught in this chapter that the church so-called of Rome, speaking of the Roman Catholic institution, has no right to rank amongst Christian churches. Now, we read this in some of our previous uh, messages. At the bottom, it says, Popery is the gospel transubstantiated into the flesh and blood of paganism. Notice this. Now, this is a picture of the God Pan, the God Pan. This is taken from the story of American Catholicism. Now, the God Pan was a pagan deity. The God Pan is the same Peter Pan that we sit down and let our children watch. Now, Peter Pan was a pedophile and a god of sexual immorality. This is why in the Peter Pan movies, Peter Pan is running around with little boys. Now, we never ask ourselves the question, what is he doing with those little boys? But the reality is, is that that is what the God Pan represents. Notice, it has often been charged that Catholicism is overlaid with, main, with many pagan incrustations. Catholicism is ready to accept that accusation. Now, again, this is from a Catholic priest. Catholicism is ready to accept that accusation and even to make it her boast. The great God Pan is not really dead. He is baptized. So what the Catholic Church is actually saying that instead of worshiping Jesus, they've just baptized the God Pan and that is the God that they are worshiping. Now, again, if they are worshiping the God Pan, that means that we must find the practices of the God Pan within the Roman Catholic institution. Notice, Catholic priests, it's empirical fact that many clergy are gay. You see, this is one of the main reasons why pedophilia is so rife within the Catholic Church because they're actually worshiping the pedophilic God Pan. Now again, there may be some of us who are Roman Catholic that have never heard this before. And the reality is, is that God is not condemning you. He is just seeking to open your eyes. It goes on to talk about all these different things. 
as it pertains to many Catholic priests being homosexuals, it's an empirical fact that lots of men are gay who are priests and they are very good priests. So in their eyes, even though you're a homosexual claiming to be a mouthpiece for God, even though you're a homosexual, uh, it's not a big deal. It says, I would also observe that the numbers of gay men and women in the church ministry is probably larger than the general population precisely because they are not seeking marriage. Now, again, this is taken from the Washington Post back in 2018. More than 300 accused priests listed in Pennsylvania report on Catholic Catholic church sex abuse. And one of the reasons as to why this is so debasing is because I believe about 80 percent of the children that are violated by Catholic priests are little boys. You would think that the men would at least, God forbid, be molesting the little girls, but they prefer the little boys. Lord have mercy. Brothers and sisters, the Bible makes it very clear that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The Bible makes it very clear that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places, in high places. Lord have mercy. More than 300 Catholic priests across Pennsylvania sexually abused children over seven decades. And just imagine this. If this is coming out in this modern day society, imagine how much child predatory sexual abuse was taking place in the dark ages when there was no publicity. When there was no, um, when there was no uh, freedom of the press and all these different things. When there was no printing press. All right, we have this other symbol here. This symbol of the PNX. Now, many of us have seen this symbol before. The question is, what does this symbol mean? Notice for, uh, this book called A Manual for the Lodge, written by the Freemason Albert Mackey. The point within the circle is an interesting fact. Is an interesting. An important symbol in Freemasonry. The symbol is really a beautiful but what somewhat obtruse allusion to the old sun worship. Again, that old sun worship, which is really just worshiping the god Nimrod. It says, and introduces us for the first time to that modification of it among the ancients as the worship of the phallus. So again, all of this sexual worship is incorporated into this Roman Catholic ideology. All right, now we come down to our last slide here. And you see, one of the main reasons, well, probably maybe the main reason, apart from being disconnected from God, as to the reason why this homosexual issue is so prevalent is because of a lack of this. You see, if there were more God-fearing Christian homes in society, the world would actually get an illustration of how true sexuality is expressed. They would get a true illustration how a family is to operate, what a real man looks like, what a real woman looks like. So we have this beautiful couple here, this older beautiful couple still in love. We have another couple here, beautiful, still in love. We have another couple here, beautiful, still in love. We have another couple here, beautiful, still in love. And we have another couple here, beautiful, still in love. And in light of that, let's turn in our Bibles to the book. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Let's turn in our Bibles book in turn in our Bibles rather to the book of Ephesians, chapter five. You see here, one of the subjects that just brings so much joy to my heart is the subject of the family. The family is by far the best and greatest institution that God has created outside of the Sabbath. This family institution goes so much to the proper consolidation of society. So much. This beautiful symbol of marital bliss. Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse... 22 the bible says wives submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the lord now even this there may be some of us as women who hear this word submit and it makes us triggered we we feel a sense of oppression even just hearing these words but the bible goes on it doesn't just stop at, at the wives submitting 
It says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but, at, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So God is making it very clear that when you have a husband who loves his wife so much that he's willing to die for her as Christ died for the church, then you will have, by the grace of God, a woman who loves her husband so much that she would be willing to submit to her husband because she knows that he loves her. Because she knows that he loves her. Now, this is a dear brother by the name of Martin Luther. This was actually the gentleman that Martin Luther King Jr. was named after. This was the 16th century Augustinian monk who nailed the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, in 1517 on October 31st. Notice. This says, now notice what Martin Luther says about marriage. Let the wife make the husband glad to come home and let, the, and let him make her sorry to see him leave. Notice. One learns more of Christ in being married and rearing children than in several lifetimes spent in study in a monastery. So again, it is true that not everyone is going to get married, but the reality is, is that the family is one of the, is the greatest institution, one of them that God has created in order to reveal to us and to develop within us his character. Now, in light of that, we're going to turn in our Bibles to the book of Psalms very quickly. I'm going to read a text. I'm going to read in Psalms chapter 60. Three Psalms chapter 63, Psalms chapter 63, Psalms chapter 63. We're going to notice what the Bible says. Psalms chapter 63. Let's see what the Bible says. Actually, it's not Psalms chapter 63, it's Psalms chapter 68. Sometimes I get these, these chapters mixed up, but Psalms chapter 68, starting in verse 5. Psalms chapter chapter 68 rather starting in verse 5 the bible says as a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is god in his holy habitation verse 6 it says god said it the solitary in families he bringeth out those which are bound with chains but the rebellious dwell in a dry land you see the reality is is that even in if we're not in a biological family god will put us in a spiritual family if we allow him to do so God will so surround us with other Christian believers that we can be a part of the family of God. Now, notice this last statement as we come to a close from the ministry of healing, because the question is many times, because even married couples watching this, seeing this presentation, they say, yes, I see the, the, the benefits of the family. I see all that God wants to give, but my marriage is not healthy. My home is not like heaven. We bicker and yell and scream, even curse at each other every single day there's no more love in our marriage and because we do not have this anymore we're thinking about getting a divorce or maybe you have a marriage where it's not as severe but that tender love is just not there that 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 beautiful uh, warmth and joy that you used to feel at the beginning of your marriage you no longer experience that there's no more love on the part of the husband there's no more love on the part of the wife notice the notice this statement Though difficulties, this is one of my favorite passages, Ministry of Healing, page 360, paragraph 2. Though difficulties, perplexities, and discouragements may arise, let neither husband nor wife harbor the thought that their union is a mistake or a disappointment. Determined to be all that it is possible to be to each other, continue the early attentions in every way encourage each other in fighting the battles of life notice study to advance the happiness of each other husband study your wife study what makes her happy and do those things that bring joy to her heart wife study your husband study those things that bring him happiness and joy and seek to cater to his heart 
let there be mutual love, mutual forbearance, then marriage, instead of being the end of love, will be as it were the very beginning of love. The warmth of true friendship, the love that binds heart to heart, is a foretaste of the joys of heaven. You see, the Bible, Jesus made it very clear that greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. What a blessed privilege that is to be within a marriage relation. And even if you're not in a marriage relation, to have a God-fearing friend or relative or whatever may have you, to have such a God-fearing, close and loving relationship that you can literally experience the friendship that will teach you more about the atmosphere of heaven. You see, brothers and sisters, we have now come down to the close of this two-part series, and we see the reality of both pride and glory. Though Satan has sought to hijack God's symbol to restore fallen man back into the image of God, God is going to do something special here in these last days to counter what Satan is preaching. And actually, that brings to my attention, let's turn to Malachi. Let's turn to Malachi, even as we talk about the last days in the family, let's turn to Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, Malachi chapter 4, as we bring this message to a close, the Bible says in verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now that great and dreadful day of the Lord, when you study in context in the Old Testament, is speaking of the second coming. In verse 6 it says, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. In these last days, God wants to do something special in the family that will have a reverberating influence, not only in the family, but in society. Not only in society, but in the church. Not only in the church, but in the world at large. And by the grace of God, it first begins with us. God is calling us to this deeper experience. God is calling for reconciliation amongst families. If there's any animosity in families, God is seeking to heal those broken wounds. He's seeking to heal those broken wounds. And in light of that, let us have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for what you've communicated. Dear Father, I pray that you would please smooth out any of the false utterances the Lord had, that have made any parts of these presentations confusing. The Lord, I pray there will be an impetus for us, Holy Father, to go back and to, and to study these things for ourselves. Lord, to, to see whether or not these things be so. I pray, the Lord, for even downloading these things to my heart and to my mind. The Lord, I pray in a very special way that you be with all those who will watch this presentation in the future, that the power of conviction may rest upon many hearts. And again, dear Lord, I just pray in a very special way. I make a very small appeal to those who want to have mending in their family relationships. It doesn't matter what it is. I just call you just to raise your hand wherever you are. Even if you're online, the Lord sees it. Dear Father, you see the raised and lifted hands. I pray in a very special way that you bring healing and restoration. And I just pray that you would keep us to this end in Jesus' name.